gonna say it anyway, I'm just, I'm just gonna mess me up. Are y'all ready for the word? Yeah. Amen. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for joy in the house. There's joy in the house because there's no fear. Perfect love drives out fear. God, we thank you that there's love in this house. Unconditional love. God, you first loved us. While we were yet sinners, you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. I pray that someone who's in here today who doesn't know that they're loved will know that they are loved. I pray that somebody will reach out and touch them, embrace them, smile at them, let them know that they are loved. It's because of love that we are saved. So God, we come to your word. And God, I pray that you'll touch us, minister to us, change us, encourage us, be glorified in the midst of us, I pray. In Jesus' name, everybody says, Amen. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles or scroll in your phones to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And we'll be reading a couple of verses, a few verses. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, starting at verse 48. John chapter 8. Starting at verse 48. How many thank God for Reverend Stratford, my spiritual mother? Didn't she bless us good last Sunday? Amen. Thank God for her ministry. John chapter 8, 48. Y'all with me? Yes. It says, The Jews answered him, and him is Jesus. I'm going to read slow. We're just going to. Take our time here. And the Jews answered him, Are we right in saying, or are we right in assuming that you are a Samaritan and demon possessed? Jesus. And Jesus says, I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who is seeking it. And he is the judge. I tell you the truth. If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. At this time, the Jews exclaimed, Now we know that you are demon possessed. Abraham died. And so did the prophets. Yet you say that if anyone keeps your word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? If you got a pen or pencil, or if you don't, steal it from your neighbor and underline that. Who do you think you are? If you got a highlighter, even better. Who do you think you are? I'll read it again, verse 53. Who do you think you are? If I could sing it in Spanish like our worship team, I would do so, but I'll say it in English. Who do you think you are? Verse 54. Amen. My translator. My translator until I can learn Espanol. And Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar, like you. But I do know him, and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. And they replied, you're not even yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him. And you have seen Abraham? Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. I want you to underline that. I am. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this as soon as he said that, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away 
from the temple grounds. Everybody say, I am. I am. We're starting a new sermon series at Richmond entitled, I Am. And we'll be studying the seven statements of Christ as is recorded in the Gospel of St. John. The reason why we are studying these statements is because part of the vision of Richmond is to preach Jesus. A Christian church is a Jesus preaching church. Can I get an amen? amen? A Christian life is a Christ-like life. Christianity, write this down. Christianity is living a life that conforms to the words of Christ. Christianity is, a, is living a life that conforms to the words of Christ. You can put it in your phone if you need to. Christianity is living a life that conforms to the words of Christ. Our lives are being transformed by the Holy Spirit. The theological term for that is sanctification. We are being transformed. We're being transformed into what? We're like a transformation. You might think of a caterpillar into a butterfly. That's my daughter's favorite book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar. Uh, the caterpillar transforms into a butterfly. Metamorphosis, transformation. We are being transformed from one nature into having the nature of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is transforming us so we reflect the image and the likeness of His Son. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. In Hebrews 1, 3. We're building here. Spiritual maturity means we behave as Jesus. Spiritual growth means we act like Jesus. Spiritual fruit means we live for Jesus. And Christianity is living a life that conforms to the words of Christ. And Jesus said in John 14, 15... If you love me, you will keep my commands. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 that a wise person puts his words into practice. And by putting his words into practice, that's, that's like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. Jesus promised that if his words remain in us, we can ask whatever we wish and it will be done for us. We express our love towards God when we keep His words. We are wise children of God when we practice His words. We are faithful and fruitful for God when we abide in His word. Christ's words must be chief over man's opinions. Am I preaching to a church this morning? Christ. Words must be central in our lives. His words are not optional suggestions. They are to be obeyed. His words are not cute axioms or bumper stickers. They are to be guides and governors for our lives. His words are not idealistic, conceptual, religious theory. They have a weight to ground us in a world that is allergic to truth, in a world that is devoid of moral authority and absolutes. His words are not outdated or stuck in another century or chained to a foreign culture. Christ's words are for everybody every day and everywhere. Y'all to shout me down if you agree with me. Christianity is living a life that conforms to the words of Christ. This is an introduction to our series. Therefore, we, 
We must confront the brutal facts about our sins, our shortcomings, our insecurities, our iniquity, our transgressions, and our vices if we want to conform to the image of Christ. We must challenge our false perceptions of our faith. We must correct our faulty theological ideas. We must construct a firm foundation that's based on biblical teaching if we want to conform to Christ's words. We must consider the implications of Christ's words. Count the cost. Measure his guilt and weigh his cross. And ultimately, we must change the way we live because Christianity is not just admiration of Christ's words, but the application of Christ's words. Amen. But not everyone admired and applauded and accepted the words of Christ. In fact, we just read in John chapter 8 that the Jewish leaders attacked Jesus' ministry. They assaulted his character without cause, and they accused him of being controlled by Satan. John chapter 8, 53, and we're just going to stick there for the duration of this sermon because I really believe there's, there's a lot to pluck out of this one question. And the question is there. Who do you think you are? What they mean by that is, by what authority do you say these things? By what authority do you do these things? And we have to understand that authority is, is either invested uh, through the law, or authority is endowed by birth, or authority is earned through mastery. What do I mean? Authority is invested through the law. We elect someone and they have authority. Or a police officer earns a badge, they have authority because of the law. Uh, authority is endowed by birth. If someone is born to a king or a queen, they are a monarchy. They have royal authority. Authority is earned through mastery. What do we mean by that? If somebody learns something, they become an expert, an authority in an area. Authority is either invested through the law or endowed by birth or earned through mastery. So they're asking Jesus, who do you think you are? They're trying to figure out the source of his authority. They wanted to see if Jesus had the proper license, the right pedigree, the perfect background to speak and operate with the level of authority that he displayed. And Jesus was called rabbi, but he worked as a unionized carpenter. And Jesus was born in the city of King David, but he was welcomed in a manger, not a palace. And Jesus didn't sit at the feet of experienced scholars, but he taught scholars as a boy. Luke 4, 32 tells us that people were amazed at Jesus' teaching because his words had authority. He spoke not from facts, but from truth, because he is the truth. He spoke not with wisdom, but as the wise one, because he is the personification of wisdom. He spoke with authority because he is the authority. Amen. Who do you think you are? And this query, this question took on various forms and was posed by different people at different times in Jesus' life. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? John the Baptist, his cousin, who baptized him in the Jordan River, sent his disciples and said, Jesus, set the record straight once and for all. Are you the Messiah or should we wait for somebody else? The grumbling and complaining Jews asked, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We, we, we know this kid. The high priest interrogated Jesus at his 
illegal trial and said, are you the son of God? Jesus clearly answered all of these questions. And we believe that Jesus is king. Amen. I said we believe that Jesus is king. He is king over all kings. Lord of lords and prince of peace. We believe that Jesus is savior. Sent to seek and to save the lost. We believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised anointed one, dispatched from divinity to redeem and rescue humanity from death eternally. We believe that Jesus is Lord, sovereign ruler, supreme judge. We believe that Jesus is Christ, Son of God, second member of the Trinity, God himself. Who am I preaching to? Up in here, Jesus is King and Savior and Messiah and Lord and Christ. That's what we believe here at Richmond. And so if you want to know our doctrine, there it is. If you want to know our theology, I just outlined it for you. If you want to know our belief, I summed it up in one name. And that one name is Jesus. Because God exalted him at the highest place and gave him a name that's above every name. That at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. John 8.53 is a very interesting verse. Who do you think you are? Another but less offensive version of the same question is, who are you? Write that down. Who are you? I mean, the pointed question, the offensive question, the rude question is, who do you think you are? But if we want to dilute it, if we want to tone it down and shave off the rough edges, a less offensive version of the same question is, who are you? And I want to dwell on this question because it's a loaded question. And some of us answer this same question by revealing who we know. And name dropping our famous connects and giving insight into our social status. When someone says, Who are you? We, we start mentioning all the famous people that, that are. I'm just going to keep on preaching. None, nobody here does stuff like that. <laughs> when someone asks you, Who are you? Some of us, we answer that question by talking about the degrees that we have accumulated or the certificates that we've racked up, or the seniority that we have acquired. Who are you? Some of us, we answer that question by explaining what we do from nine to five, or repeating the bullet points on our resume or our job description. Who are you? Some of us, we answer that question by sharing where we've been and what we've done. Who are you? To be honest, some of us, don't know who we are. Smart, yes. Street savvy, yes. Spirit filled, yes. But some of us still don't know who we are. We are aware of our gender, our name. We're emotionally and mentally healthy, but when it comes to pinpointing the coordinates of our precise location on the map called destiny, we're lost and confused. Who are you? 30, 40, 50 years of age and we still don't know. We've got gray hair, white hair, graduated from the School of Hard Knocks, but we've never received a diploma in self-discovery. Who are you? In another sense, it's a stealth question. Who are you? It's, it's a stealth question. It flies under the radar of detection because depending on the person accent, it, it appears innocent and harmless. And in some cases, we ask the question for a purpose. Who are you? We, we pose that question to size 
somebody up to see if they fit in. Y'all ain't talking to me. We, we, we want to see if they fit neatly inside the box of our religion. Oh, wow, real quiet enrichment. <laughs> we want to see if they fit neatly inside the box of our personality preference. Who are you? We, we, we want to size them up to see if they fit inside the box of our politics. Hmm. Who are you? We, we want to see if they're the right fit inside the box of our culture. We want to confirm if they have the same style, the similar taste, and have certain things in common with us. Who are you? We're sizing up. We're trying to gauge to see if they are like us. And truth be told, if we're really want to be transparent and vulnerable. We're trying to figure out if the person even likes us. Hmm. Who are you? We all, we all answer it differently, but for most of us, we're, we're quick to cling to the flag of our nationalistic pride. I'm African, I'm Nigerian, I'm Liberian, I'm Puerto Rican. Who are you? We're, we're, we're quick to clutch the banner of our cultural or tribal colors. Who, who are you? We're, we're, we're quick to grip the uh, ancestral garments of our heritage. Who are you? We are conditioned to answer the question as we would any government issue for. Everything gets reduced to check boxes and fill in the blank forms. And so I'm here today to tell somebody that you are more than that medical condition. Amen. You are more than that past mistake. Amen. You are more than a score. You are more than a number. You are more than a grade. You are more than any label that man tries to put on you. You are more than your supervisor's report or some expert's analysis. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are smart. You are special. You are anointed. You are redeemed. You are a new creation. You are a child of God. You are the head. You are royalty. You are holy. You are chosen. You are strong. You are courageous. You are at peace. You are victorious. You are covered in grace. You are filled with love. You are blessed. You are destined to achieve. You are pregnant with potential. You will give birth to success. You will bear fruit. That's who you are. I want to circle back to this question. John chapter 8, 53. I warned you that we're going to stay there for a little bit because it, it's loaded. Who do you think you are? Jesus. Who do you think you are? They're probably snapping their neck, rolling their eyes. <laughs> Nobody here at Richmond does that. <laughs> you all sanctified folks. Nobody cuts their eyes at nobody. <laughs> Jesus, who do you think you are? You, you allowed a prostitute to do the feet washing ministry? Who do you think you are? You, you appointed tax collectors as an assistant pastor? Who do you think you are? You, you, you made fishermen demon-casting apostles? You, you were baptized by a prophet who eats honey and wore camel hair. Who, who, who do you think you are, Jesus? You touched and were touched by the unclean. You, you stop for street beggars and you pause your sermon for the cripple to be dropped in the middle of a whole Bible study. You use your spit and mud to heal the blind. Who do you think you are, Jesus? You cancel the public execution of an adulterous woman. You were willing to heal the slave of an enemy soldier. And you repaired the severed ear of the SWAT team that came to arrest you. You didn't harbor racism towards Samaritans. And you spoke of sheep in God's flock that we didn't know about. Who do you think 
take you up. You rebuke your disciples for intercepting children from coming to you. You stop the funeral procession of a little boy. And although you are perfect and without sin, you weren't too good to hang out with sinners. You turned water into wine and ate, ate food without washing your hands according to religious tradition. You multiplied a kid's happy meal and fed 5,000 men. We go to McDonald's too much for Avenue. We gotta take that out. I'm making its way into my sermon. <laughs> you remixed and revised the Passover meal to symbolize you. Who do you think you are, Jesus? You are unafraid of the demon possessed. But you're gentle enough to hold the hand of a dead girl. You have authority to command the winds and the waves, peace, be still. But you ordered your disciples to pay taxes to Caesar. Who do you think you are? You commanded dead Lazarus to come forth. But you chose to take the spit on your face and the bruises on your back, and you allowed yourself to be killed. Who do you think you are, Jesus? Richmond, Jesus didn't fit into any religious box. <laughs> Jesus couldn't be defined by any labels. He couldn't be pegged or pigeonholed or stereotyped. And I believe that some people foolishly believe that if that, 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 that they can fully explain God. They, they, they believe that they can explain God with charts and formulas and, and reason. Too many people foolishly believe that they can decode the divine. So they can try to manipulate God like DNA in a test tube. Mankind has always displayed arrogance towards God. We wanted to be like God, and so we ate the forbidden fruit. We wanted to build a house up to God, so we built the Tower of Babel. Mankind has always displayed arrogance towards God. Man has always tried to fashion God into a golden calf. And then we call it religion. The question remains, who is Jesus Christ? This is not a religious question. This is not a pseudo-philosophical query. This is not some intellectual exercise. The eternal destiny of our soul hangs in the balance from the answer to this question. How you answer this question today determines where you spend eternity. Because if anyone confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord, they will be saved. If anyone believes in the Son, they will have eternal life. Jesus was challenged by these so-called religious leaders of the day. Who are you? The Jews, they would have been okay if Jesus claimed to be a Samaritan because they, they, they said it in the, in the verse, uh, you know, confirm for us that you're a Samaritan. We'll, we'll be okay if you say you're a Samaritan. And we have to understand that Samaritans, for the Jews, they, 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 they despise the Samaritans. Jews and Samaritans didn't get along. There was racial tension there. As a matter of fact, Jews call Samaritans a racial slur. And here's the racial slur, you dog. So they're saying, Jesus, we're okay if you're a Samaritan. They even went so far to say, you know what, we'll accept the fact that you're demon-possessed. There you go. That explains it all. He's demon-possessed. 
Look at verse 58. Here's Jesus' response. Verily, truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. And that answer almost got Jesus jumped. <laughs> Killed right there on the spot. And the reason why this answer is so controversial and significant is because the I am of Christ takes us back to the Old Testament in Exodus. That's how Jehovah God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. When Moses was, 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 was stopped by God uh, in the wilderness, and Moses asked God, listen, I'm going to go to these people. They're going to ask me for credentials. They're going to ask me for my license. They're going to ask me who sent me. What's your name? And the self-existent God replied, I am that I am. Exodus 3, 14. So this statement, I am, is Jesus' boldest declaration about himself. Because to state that he is, I am, is to imply that he is the same God who sent Moses to get the Hebrew people out of Egypt. Amen. To say that he is I am is to imply that he is the same God who made a deal with their ancestor called Abraham. I am is not a grammatical error. I am is a statement of Godness. I am is a supreme declaration of deity. Before Abraham was I am. Jesus was not only before Abraham, he was before Adam. Christ did not claim before Abraham I was, but I am. No, he said I am. That expresses essential, eternal being. I and no one else am always. Amen. And so, yes, historically speaking, Jesus had his birth in Bethlehem. That's why we celebrate Christmas. But he had his birth in Bethlehem, but not his beginning. He was born in Bethlehem, but not his beginning, because he never had a beginning. There was never a time when Jesus was not God, and there is not a time when he will not stop being God. Amen. He is the only person who was ever born that at the moment of his birth was older than his mother. <laughs> and as old as his father. Because he is the eternal God, without beginning, without end. He is the great I am. Amen. I am. Before the creation of the world, he was the I am. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. All things were created through him. Not one thing was created that had been created. He was God. Wonder of wonders. God manifests in the flesh. God pleading with men. God on the cross. God in glory and coming in the clouds. Great is the mystery of God. There is no time limit to the life of the great I am. The life of Abraham was limited, and we know the time of his birth, and we know the time of the existent one. He is timeless, and he is interested in his time rather than time itself. Jesus is always the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, verse 8. If the question is, who is Jesus? The answer is, I am. And Jesus uses this special and sacred 
Old Testament handle strategically throughout the New Testament gospel accounts. Jesus Christ is quoted using this expression, I am, at least seven or eight times. Seven of these claims were in connection with a descriptive term and illustrated by a sign or a wonder or a miracle that supported his claim. Everybody say, I am. I am. When we break that down, what I am means is, I will be what I will be. Amen. When God says, I am that I am, he is saying, I will be what I will be. So I'm here today to tell somebody that God is your answer. Amen. God is your provider. God is your deliverer. God will be in your life what you need him to be, whatever the situation, whatever the circumstance, whatever the challenge, whatever the need, whatever the choices, whatever the problem, God will be what you need him to be. God will be what you need him to be. Comfort for your soul. Healing for your pain. Provision for your need. Victory in your battle. Wisdom in making decisions. I am means I will be what I will be. I am implies unlimited power, unrestricted authority. Nothing is impossible for God. God is awesome in power. He is great in glory. He is magnificent in wonder. God is all powerful. Now make no mistake about it. Our all-powerful God is not some distant deity, nor is he some figure in history, Jesus Christ. He is the living God, the great I am. And when we go through this series, we will love Jesus more. We'll see how the divine life is intended to work itself out in daily living. And this series is, is, is really designed to stretch all of us to look to the Lord daily for our needs. Because there is no substitute for Jesus Christ. I said there is no substitute for Jesus Christ. Only Jesus can save us from our sins and give us the grace we need to live for him. And if we want fullness of life, we have to go to Jesus. The way we relate to the Lord determines how he will relate to us. He says in James 4, 8, come near to God and he will come near to you. And John 15, verse 5. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so it is a tragedy, a great tragedy for us to have an active and a successful life and then at the end of it all discover that nothing of it lasts. That nothing of it counted. No leader, no authority, no organization, no set of religious Disciples can do for us what Jesus alone can do if we let him. Even this sermon that I'm preaching, even this sermon that you're listening to now can only point you to Jesus. And so hear me, this is important, and I want you to write this down. Divine truth becomes dynamic life only when we yield to Jesus by faith and follow him. Divine truth becomes dynamic life only when we yield to Jesus by faith and follow him. Divine truth becomes dynamic faith, dynamic life, only when we yield to Jesus by faith and follow Jesus. If the founders 
of the world's philosophies and religious systems were alive on this earth today, they can only say, I was. They're dead in a grave, and they cannot help us. Jesus didn't say that. He didn't say, I was. He is alive, and he is sitting at the right hand of the Father. That's why he says, I am. Amen. And we can meet our needs together. He is alive. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Past history, present reality, future certainty, all united together in Jesus Christ. The great I am. In this series, we're going to examine the seven claims of Christ. As Justin makes his way to the keyboards to play software. Christ gives us various object lessons to make his great claim. And it's my prayer that as we go through this series that we will find in the great I am to be, number one, the bread of life. The bread of life who sustains and satisfies our soul and heart. Number two, my prayer is that we'll find in the great I am the light of the world. That we follow with the promise that we will not walk in darkness. It's my prayer that we'll find in the great I am the door for an abundant and joyous life in Christ. It's my prayer that through this series we'll discover Jesus to be the great shepherd who knows all about us and loves us and laid down his life for us so that we might have eternal life. Amen. It's my prayer for those who have a heart of sorrow or who have been living in the fear of death that they will find the I am to be the resurrection yeah. and the life. It's my prayer that we'll discover the I am to be absolutely the way, the truth, and the life. And I hope that this series will help us to understand that we need to abide in the true vine, which is Jesus Christ. Let's stand together.